So this is the first time I'm trying this system. So as expected, uh, I was on the green room before that and I tried and everything worked, but you know, now it's not working. So um, um, when I was previously on uh, Anna's uh, ZK study club uh, crowdcast thing, I, I sort of uh, described, uh, you know, a little bit about my story and how I reached, uh, um, you know, the, the whole area of uh, blockchains and zero knowledge proofs. And I also suggested to talk a little bit about some, some something that is more related to sort of math intuition, and in particular, the connection between um, uh, the mysterious connection between uh, the fast Fourier transform and um, and and proof systems. Okay, so there are like going to be three basically three characters that we'll talk about uh, today. I hope this will take about uh, forty-five to fifty minutes, and then I'll leave time for for questions. So. I hope to reach, uh, you know, uh, to end by the, the top of next hour and then leave time to questions. I'll try from time to time to pause and and look at some comments or questions, but but I already uh, in advance uh, um, apologize for not being able to, you know, multitask and see everything at once. Um, and another thing I'm going to be trying for the very first time to do this with the aid of, uh, of, a, uh, of an app, of a whiteboard app, We'll see how it works. Um, so without further ado, I want to talk, uh, let's move to the, um, let's move to the, uh, I want to move to the, uh, what should it call them? Yeah, to this thing. And now let's, uh, uh, without further ado, start and uh, discuss uh, the three characters that we'll have today. So I want to talk about um, three things. I want to talk about um, the fast Fourier transform, known as the FFT. I want to talk about uh, things like uh, proofs, and in particular, proofs that are um, transparent that have no trusted setup. Uh, so, in particular, things like uh, Starks and uh, IOPs. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about in the middle is going to be the probabilistically checkable proof theorem, which is sort of uh, the way these three things are connected, okay? So these are going to be the three main characters, fa fast Fourier transforms, the PCP theorem, and, and proof systems. And basically, I want to show how, uh, you know, FFTs can be used to build uh, uh, efficient proofs, and this goes back to the way the uh, theorem of probabilistically checkable proofs was constructed. So, um, what I'll do is I'll use this uh, sort of uh, screen thing, and we'll start with the first character, which is the fast Fourier transform. So let me just move to some uh, other area of the screen and uh, use that to discuss it. Okay, so what is the fast Fourier transform? So as transform. So as the very last uh, word here um, suggests, it is a transformation. It is you move from one way of representing data, usually some, some sort of waveform, and you can go into something that looks, uh, you know, often something like this, and you can also go in the other direction. So it is a way for transforming uh, data. One direction is usually called the FFT. The other direction is called the inverse FFT. And a different way, so often people will talk about a representation here by time, and here they'll talk about representation by frequency. Um, and the fast Fourier transform or the Fourier transform in general is extremely uh, useful for a lot of things in, in mathematics and uh, physics and engineering. So it's a very good way to deal with signal processing, understanding waves and, and regular phenomena, but it's also a very uh, fundamental tool in mathematics in, in number theory and combinatorics and other areas. Um, it's useful all over the place. So wait, I just want to check that. So can you, is everyone hearing me? Is everything okay? Can someone just, uh, just so I know because I can't hear anything. Can someone type? Are you following me? Is uh, everyone on board? 
Okay, cool. Yeah, good. Now, a different way to view it is as a transformation between um, representing data as a as a function. So we have some function that goes from some uh, domain um, s, and it goes to some field. Usually, this is the field of reals or of, of uh, or often of uh, complex numbers. And here we have uh, a different view of things as basically as some polynomial a of x that uh, interpolates this data. So if the size of s equals n, uh, we get a polynomial of degree at most n in this direction. And uh, going in this direction is often called uh, interpolation. And going in the other direction is often called evaluation, right? And this is very similar to what we do with, let's say, two points. If we have two points on the plane, we can sort of figure out what is the what are the coefficients of the line that goes through them. If we have three points, uh, we can figure out what is the you know parabola or degree two polynomial that goes through them. And in general, if we have uh, n points in the plane, we can interpolate and find some uh, unique polynomial that is of degree less than n that will pass exactly through these points. So um, the Fourier transform can also be viewed as something that moves from a uh, description of something as a function to something that des describes it as a polynomial. And um, I wanna talk a little bit about the word um, uh, fast, right? So what do we mean by fast? So we're moving from one representation of data. So basically we have uh, here on the right side, we have a bunch of coefficients maybe a0 up to a a and minus one. On the other side, we have uh, a bunch of evaluations. We have f at the point x0, and we have the evaluation of the function f at the point x n minus one. And we want to move uh, between the two kind of uh, representations. And if we them as vectors, it turns out that there's actually a matrix that we can multiply by. Uh, it's a Vandermond matrix. If we take this matrix and multiply it by A, we get the um, uh, evaluation direction. And this is an invertible matrix. So if we multiply by the uh, sequence of elements that describes the function, we will get the interpolation. So this is the uh, interpolation. So we have this matrix. And again, so what we, what we mean by, by fast, let me use all kinds of things. So what we mean by fast is that um, the time it takes to compute this transformation is uh, only something like n log n, where the length of this thing is n. So it's trivially doable, to do, it's trivial to do it in time um, n squared, right? because we can just multiply by this matrix, which is an n by n matrix, um, and that will take us time n squared. So the whole thing about the fast Fourier transform is that for, in certain cases, for certain values of x, we can do this transformation really quickly, okay? Now, this is what I wanna say about the fast Fourier transform. So it has nothing to do with zero knowledge proofs. It has nothing to do with proof systems. It has no cryptography in it. It comes from this field of physics and um, you know signal processing uh, it's a way to move between time and, and uh, frequency domains right it seems as unrelated to uh, cryptography blockchains and proof systems as one could think about but actually um, there are connections that we want to explore today so before moving on to proof systems and then going back to polynomials and and, and uh, Fourier transforms um, I want to mention that the Fourier basis and the Fourier transform and this whole theory that, that looks at, uh, at uh, you know, what is the Fourier transform is one of those, uh, you know, prosaic elephants that you can come to it from many different directions and you see different parts of it. So uh, it's related to uh, group theory in mathematics. It's related to number theory. It's related to signal processing. It's related to uh, proof systems as we'll see today it has a lot of generalizations and, and variations 
um, that uh, I'm not going to attempt uh, an exploit today. I'm just going to add. So I'm, we're going to be coming at this elephant, right, that has many different parts. Um, we're going to come at it from one very particular angle and just see one little part of this uh, magnificent concept that's called the Fourier transform. Um, and the elephant story, I mean, this, uh, this, uh, right, this tale about the seven uh, blind people who walk and each one of them comes to an elephant from a dif different direction. One of them um, feels the, the, the foot and says, this is, uh, you know, a big palace. Someone else feels the tail, says it's a snake and so on and so forth. And of course, the elephant is something bigger than that. So the Fourier transform is one another of those things. Okay. So... We have this uh, transformation. Now let's talk, let's jump to this completely other area of proof systems. And the common theme between uh, proof systems and uh, Fourier is actually going to be um, uh, this thing that is, uh, you know, the notion of polynomial. Okay, that's gonna be the connecting uh, link between fast Fourier transforms uh, that come from like physics and signal processing and this area of proof systems that's very different. So let's sort of uh, just pan out and then move this whiteboard somewhere else, like maybe over here. Now let's increase the size again. Thanks for bearing with me um, as I'm exploring this uh, new uh, kind of uh, technology. Let me just jump back one second and see, are there any, uh, like, is everyone following me? Are you fine with what we're speaking? Um, I would like to pause and take some questions, but uh, you know what, let's give it a try. Does someone, if someone wants to ask, let's, let's like pause. If there are some questions, please use the ask a question or wait like two minutes just to see if there are any uh, questions on this part before we move on to uh, proof systems. Okay, I see all is good. So maybe I'll jump back. Okay, thicker lines, please. Thank you very much. That's a very good comment. I will move to thicker lines now. Great. Okay. So back we go and we are going to use a thicker line. Let's go with uh, maybe size uh, size three. Let's try that. Okay. So now I wanna talk about, uh, you know, some uh, um, too good to be true proof system. And I'm thinking here of some proof system that is interactive. So on the one side, I think this line size is actually a little bit too large for me. I'll just go down to size two. Okay. So now the proof system that we'll look at, uh, there's gonna be a prover that sits here on this side. And then there's a verifier that sits here. And there's uh, a verifier. And there's some statement that uh, needs to be proved, right? So the statement could be something like, you know, I have a uh, hundred uh, BTC now. So this is what the um, this is what the prover is sending over to the verifier. So maybe this is like stage zero. This is what the prover is sending. Now the verifier in this system is basically, so what I'm describing here is some ideal proof system that if we could have it, it would be amazingly, you know, it would work amazingly well. And actually almost all proof systems that are deployed out there, you know, Snarks, uh, Bulletproofs, uh, um, uh, Marlin, Fractal, Redshift, uh, Spartan, they are variants of, of this thing that I'm now describing. So there's a statement that needs to be proved. It could be in zero knowledge. It could be a, a statement that you want to prove very succinctly. So what the verifier is going to do, so there's some, there's going to be some interaction. What the verifier is going to send over, the verifier is going to send over basically three things. Some description of a finite field, like some FP. 
there's going to be some degree parameter d and there's going to be some integer k um, that's the second step the prover is now going to respond with basically um, k polynomials so the parameter k that the verifier has asked for defines how many polynomials does should the prover send over or give oracle access and each one of them is a univariate polynomial so they come from the field fp and they are in a single variable and they are of degree less than d okay that's the second step now the third step in this protocol is that the prover sends some queries basically the prover sorry the verifier samples um so these are random queries the verifier is asking you know what is the value of p1 at the point you know on, on seven and what is the value of pk uh, on the number 15. so this query set is basically some subset of uh field elements and you know which uh which of the polynomials are you querying at which point now the prover answers uh gives some answers and basically each query gets a field element that's an answer so this is uh, something that comes from a set of answers. Uh, basically, for each uh, query, there's a single answer. And now, finally, there's uh, the decision, which is either that the verifier is, uh, you know, happy and accepts it or, uh, you know, is, is unhappy and doesn't reject it. It's one of these two things. Now... This is what almost all proof systems in one form or another look like. And I just want to mention that the, you know, a few important factors that, that make this extremely efficient and are not uh, immediately uh, evident. So let me just point them out. In this ideal proof system, first of all, the uh, number of queries can be very small. So the number of queries can be like whatever, three or something very small, and it's independent of the statement actually can be made very independent of the statement so even if the statement talks about you know not a hundred btc but it talks about a thousand btc and like uh you know a million steps of some computation you could still make this a uh, number of queries be very small like three so that's really good another thing is that the size of the field can also be made extremely small so the size of this field can be let's say less than uh you know less than or equal to like two to the power 128 so each field element is represented by uh, 16 bytes, right? 128 uh, field elements. Um, sorry, 128 bits. So it's a very small field. It's very convenient to work with. You can even make it smaller. Um, so, uh, and, and also this decision runs in, uh, so this decision can run in time, in very short time, run in uh, basically log of the size of the computation time so the decision can be made very succinctly and you can make this whole protocol be as i said zero knowledge and succinct so from the verifier's point of view there's a very simple process here it's also i should also mention it's also transparent meaning in this uh way i'm representing it there's no need for any trusted setup you know th these things are actually deterministically fixed by the statement um these are the random queries that's the only part that's random and they could be based on basically public randomness so it's a completely transparent system there are no secrets no trusted setup no number theoretic assumptions one can add that this is also post-quantum secure um it's really a great uh a great proof system um there's only one downside to it and 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 it has to do with uh with this thing you know basically with of this whole notion what does it mean for the prover to give us um these k polynomials of degree d i should point that uh, i mean here's the problem is that d generally speaking is bigger than the size of the computation so now we start getting into all sorts of problems about efficiency succinctness um, if the computation is, let's say, takes the min steps, basically saying, oh, we need the ability to query polynomials that each one of them is of degree one million, which means that each one of them has a million coefficients. So how are you going to query these things, right? Um, one option is to have the prover 
send to us all these coefficients. But that's basically um, as bad as having to run the whole computation. And, and that's not going to be succinct. It also, in many cases, is not going to be zero knowledge. So basically, all of this effort was, was for nil. We could have just uh, you know, ran the computation ourselves or asked for the addresses of these 100 BTC. So really, it's all about how do we get the prover to behave with integrity? How do we get the prover to somehow commit or you know, pick polynomials um, that are of large degree and then answer them in, a, in an honest and integrity preserving way uh, with respect to the queries that come afterwards, right? And this is the core of the problem. So again, to summarize this part, let me just jump back and see if there are any, um, let me, uh, I'll, I'll address the question in, in uh, uh, the questions in a minute. Let me just jump back here and, and just uh, comment on, on what situation we have here. So if we could somehow get the prover to uh, um, honestly um, comply with this protocol of picking some K polynomials of huge degree, as large and then respectfully answering or and honestly answering queries with respect to those polynomials, then we would get uh, an amazingly good uh, proof system. It could be zero knowledge and very succinct. Now, I, 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 I so, so the challenge is going to be how do we get the prover to comply with this protocol of uh, low degreeness? Now, I just want to, um, yeah, now I'm, I'm going to answer a few questions. So I see that Olivier is asking, is n lan n the theoretical limit for FFT? That's a very famous open problem in theoretical computer science. Um, we don't know, we don't know to prove this. A lot of people uh, uh, believe that's the case, but we don't know of any lower bound that is better than omega of n for almost any computation. So we don't know. We believe it's the correct uh, theoretical limit, but we don't know. Um, so we don't know even if it's the practical limit, but uh, okay. And then someone, uh, Chris is asking, is two to the 128, is it small? So um, I, I would argue that it's very small and this two to the 128 is if you want to get to something like, you know, 100 bits of security. So uh, look at it from the verifier's point of view. The verifier is only going to sample in the way we described it, three queries. Each one of these queries is 128 bits. So it's basically 48 bytes. So the verifier sends 48 bytes and gets uh, three field elements back, which are 48 bytes again, if my math is correct. And the probability of error of not answering correctly will be something like two to the minus uh, 90. And this would hold even if the computation that you're dealing with is something like, you know, the correctness of all of Bitcoin's uh, blockchain or something like that. So yes, it is relatively small. You can make it even smaller if you want. Uh, yeah, okay. So this was the second part. Uh, let's let me go back to the um, to the whiteboard. Wait, I just want. Oh, I see there are questions. Wait, wait. Let me address some questions. Sorry. So one question is: Can you please tell us about the space efficiency of performing FFTs? So the short answer is that there's a trade-off. So the trade-off is um, basically says that. Um, if you want to do it in time uh, n log n, you can do it with uh, space n. If you want to do it with uh, space that is O of 1, we know how to do it with n squared, and you can interpolate with n squared time. And you can interpolate, you know, there's there's the function that interpolates in the middle. So, like, if you want to do it in time with space n over 2, it would take you something like uh, 2 squared times n log n. And if you want to do it with, uh, so basically, it's n over k. You can do it with n over k space, but you have to pay with like um, whatever interpolates between uh, one and n. Uh, so maybe it's k. Okay, you can do it with any space, but you'll pay with time. And there is a very well-known function uh, how to do it. Okay, another question. Proof systems. 
Do you have to instantiate your proof system with a specific NP statement as opposed to embed the statement with the proof? So in this ideal uh, system that I was describing, you don't have to instantiate your proof system with a specific NP statement. The way it works in this ideal system is that prover comes up with a statement that she wants to prove. And based on that statement, the verifier will figure out the, you know, all the parameters, which there are three of them, you know, the, the, the field size, um, the, the degree and the, um, the number of polynomials. And, and you can actually, if you want to fix, uh, you can actually fix those in advance, assuming that you know all kinds of bounds on the running time of, of the prover. You know, so if the prover is never going to run or if uh, an attacker never has running time more than two to the 80, then you can probably uh, limit, uh, you know, the parameters of, uh, you know, number of uh, polynomials and the, the degree and the proof size this way. But I wanted to specify it in that way because it basically captures a whole lot of proof systems that are already out there. Okay. Why is this system too good to be true? Um, first of all, it's post-quantum secure. This proof system is actually even secure against an, a computationally unbounded prover, the way I described it, right? As long as you can get the prover to actually honestly answer according to polynomials, it's a provably um, statistically and information theoretically sound uh, proof system. In particular, you need no cryptographic assumptions. So, and it has like really amazingly good parameters in terms of the communication complexity, the randomness, the number of queries and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, you could do in some of these parameters a little bit better, but you'll pay be, be paying in others. So it's a pretty darn good proof system. Uh, it's just you know we don't we 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 because of this uh, we don't uh, you know we don't know of an effective way to get this ideal system right. We're going to have all kinds of approximations that force the prover to commit and and, and you know pick low degree polynomials and then show us that these were low degree polynomials. That's why it's too good to be true. Yes. Uh, the next question, how large, how small can the field be? Is two to the 64, what about two to the 32? Well, okay, there are generalizations where you can have the field be of size, um, you know, four bits or eight bits, yeah. but you will move to more exotic creatures called uh, uh, algebraic geometry codes. Um, so there's really no lower limit on the, uh, there's no lower bound on the size of the field. Um, and in particular, uh, the size of the field can be very, very small, and you can still uh, and you can still get uh, arbitrarily good security. You will be paying in other ways, yeah. So, uh, but uh, two to the yeah. So, so it doesn't have to be two to the one twenty eight. It can be much smaller. Um, I, I just want to mention, in particular, for instance, you know, at Starkware, we're, one of the things we're doing is building a code for the Stark friendly hash for the Ethereum Foundation. The field there is going to be less than sixty four bits even though the security is going to be, uh, um, uh, you know, 80 or 128 bits uh, of security. So not only can you do this theoretically, actually in practice, it's quite efficient. Okay. Ah, what is C here? C is like the size of the computation. So if you think of it as a circuit, it would be the number of gates there. And if you think of it as some uh, computer program, it would be uh, the number of steps of this computer program that it takes. So it's sort of the size of the computation. Okay, thank you very much. These are really, really, really great questions. Good. And yeah, I'm seeing here no assumptions, no cryptographic assumptions. Yes, in what I described so far, there are no cryptographic assumptions, but uh, we will need cryptography before we're done because... Uh, uh, you know, in order to get this, um, in order to solve this particular problem, we're definitely going to, we don't know how to solve it without cryptography. Okay, good. So now uh, we have the second candidate. And again, I want to point out that the polynomials, oops, um, you know, we have here polynomials appearing uh, in both sides of this uh, world. So, the next thing I want to um, describe is how, wrong direction. Huh. Somehow this thing now got stuck somewhere. Let me just do a control R. And then, uh... Oh, 
Okay. I want to go over here. Now I want to increase the size again. I want to be somehow good. So now let's move to the next part of our story. And this part now talks about how we use polynomials to uh, to uh, get uh, uh, to solve this problem. Okay. So polynomials, polynomials as code. So an error correcting code is a way for adding redundancy to a computation. And basically we take some, uh, uh, you know, some, we take some short uh, message. So this could be a message. And then we apply some transformation to it and make it a much uh, longer uh, code word. And what we did is we add redundancy. So, you know, this could be the original message, but then all of this part is redundancy. And in particular, one very good way for doing this is we take uh, the message and we think of it as coefficients of a polynomial, a zero up to a uh, d minus one. We think of our message as a bunch of, uh, um, you know, coefficients, and then we sort of uh, encode it by um, something much larger that could be the evaluation map. And then we encode it as something where we basically, uh, you know, evaluate this uh, polynomial A at the point uh, one, we evaluate A at some point uh, omega, we evaluate it A at some point omega squared, I'm picking these points very in a very peculiar way. And then we evaluate it to some point A to be N minus one, and we pick uh, N to be much, much greater than D. And it turns out that if we do this process of taking um, you know, a bunch of, of symbols and evaluating them at many, many points, we get a very good redundancy. And why, by the way, this, this code is known as the read Solomon code. It was invented, or I mean, its use as an error correcting code for for use in uh, um, radio transmissions was first discussed in the 1960s by Reed and Solomon, and later, 30 years later, it was implemented in uh, CDs and DVDs. So um, here you can see again that polynomials are playing a part. We we can, one way to uh, create error correcting codes is to take a bunch of uh, symbols and then evaluate them at a uh, large number of positions. And this should resemble um, what goes on with the um, FFT transformation, because there we took uh, N symbols, and we, um, which are the coefficients of a polynomial, and we uh, right, evaluated them. Um, we have, I just, let me just show you what we had back there. We took uh, N symbols, right, was here, and we wanted to evaluate them. So right here, we took uh, uh, symbols and we evaluated them through the evaluations there. Okay, so on one hand, uh, using polynomials is good and you can evaluate them quite efficiently using the fast Fourier transform. On the other hand, you can also use them as a way, as one of the ways to solve this problem here, right? You can use them somehow to solve this problem here. Because one way to get the prover to answer honestly with respect to some polynomials is to tell the prover at this point, please, uh, prover, please evaluate your polynomials on n points, even though they're supposed to be of the, and pick n to be much, much, much larger than uh, d, so that we get a lot of redundancy. And it turns out that if we do this, we actually, that's one of the ways in which you can get a pretty efficient proof system. This is the way, for instance, that our Starks work. Uh, there are a lot of other proof systems that are all of them transparent and post-quantum secure and work in a similar way by asking the prover to commit 
using some uh, cryptographic commitment scheme to an evaluation of, of polynomials. I can mention a few of them. There is a um, there is a Marlin, there is Ligero, there is a Zikabu, um, uh, Aurora, succinct Aurora, uh, Redshift. I'm probably remembering a whole lot of them. They all work by this method where you basically um, take your information and you add redundancy to it in the form of an error correcting code. And that's how you get uh, a good, uh, uh, you know, good defense against uh, provers that, uh, that they're trying to cheat. Okay. So one connection between proof systems and, and uh, the fast Fourier transform is that uh, you can use the fast Fourier transform in order to compute quickly um, the evaluation of, of polynomials. But I want to say that it actually goes even deeper, the connection. There's actually the way that we, we get good proofs in, in Stark systems for um, low degreeness and for the fact that we need it here, for the fact that something is of degree less than D. The way we get these proofs that something is of degree less than D is by deploying something that looks very much like the fast Fourier transform. And that's what is going to be the next uh, part of our talk. So in this part, I want to dive a little bit deeper into how the um, FFT actually works, because that's really uh, where a lot of the magic is. Wait, so let me once again stop and uh, ask, are there any questions so far? Yeah, I want to answer a few questions. So um, I'm missing here something. If both the verifier and the prover know the polynomial, then why do we need to commit? That's a that's an excellent question. So the answer is this: the the, the verifier does not know the polynomials. Only the prover, you know, an honest prover. Like if the prover is making the statement, "I own a hundred Bitcoin," so it's the prover who knows what are these polynomials. The only thing the verifier knows is all kinds of bounds on the degrees of the polynomials and the number of polynomials. But the entity constructing the polynomials is going to be the prover, right? So there's asymmetry in information here. The prover knows the polynomials. The verifier only knows uh, abstract bounds on things like degree. And it has a bunch of constraints that it is going to evaluate without getting all of the polynomials rather just by evaluating them at a random point. Okay, so I'm going to see go to the act questions. What is the idea behind using RS codes and not the other ones? For instance, GOPA codes. That's a very good question. So first of all, um, you can use GOPA codes, and they work amazingly well. In fact, if you go and search algebraic geometry and PCPs, you will see a, a large number of publications that precisely use GOPA codes in order to achieve all kinds of things that are much better in terms of the proof length and the answer size and a lot of other beautiful things um, that go beyond what Reed Solomon codes give you. The reason, so, so there's nothing bad with GOPA codes. They work, everything that you can do with uh, Reed Solomon codes in the context of proof systems, you can do with GOPA codes. The caveats are, so, so the benefit of moving to these more exotic codes, the GOPA codes, are that you, you definitely save in, in having much smaller alphabet size, but you increase your sort of uh, mental complexity because these are more exotic codes that are harder to understand. They're harder to build. There are all kinds of uh, intricate uh, you know, pathological things that start arising from the fact that the genus is not zero, but something greater than that. And there are all kinds of anomalies that you have to deal with. So you can pretty much do everything you do with uh, with RS codes. You can replace it with GOPA codes, but they'll be um, uh, harder to work with. Another very important aspect is that for some kinds of GOPA codes, we don't have very good algorithms for encoding and for even finding a basis for them for the uh, for the for the space of, of, of code words, um, you know, in particular some of these tower fields and so on. And definitely, you don't have FFT like uh, running times for some of these exotic creatures. So that's another uh, reason why, in practice, they haven't appeared so far. But that's an excellent question. Okay, how is redundancy 
a defense mechanism and how much redundancy that's that's a that's a spectacular question again um so um the amount of redundancy in error correcting codes is measured by a parameter known as the rate and the rate is the ratio it's 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 a fraction it's between zero and one and it's a it's a it's the ratio of the number of symbols in the message to the size of the code word so for instance rate half means that the amount of added redundancy exactly equals the amount of uh information and rate uh one eighth means that basically the number of evaluation points is eight times greater than the um, degree of the polynomial. And it turns out that a significant part of the error in proof systems that, that use um, polynomials, the error is proportional to the rate, which gives you an interesting trade-off. So if you decrease the rate, you get smaller error, which is good, but your prover pays uh, because, you know, for any fixed amount of information, now he needs to run more time. And actually our Stark provers um, and our Stark systems um, all sort of fall under this sort of uh, trade-off and we try to optimize it. So we, you know, and, and, and again, if I go back to this Ethereum Foundation code that we'll, we'll release, we're sort of considering how to set the rate parameter so that we uh, optimize the trade-offs, that the prover doesn't run, run too long. And at the same time, uh, you get good enough soundness. So that's a really great question. OK. So let's go back to this uh, third and, and last part of, of our story, which is going to be to connect, um, right, to connect uh, how the FFT, the fast Fourier transform, can actually give you something a little bit more than just an efficient algorithm to evaluate polynomials. So if you remember the FFT, um, there is often, uh, oops, that's not the right thing. I want the pen. I want the pen. So let's see. This is the pen. Good. So if you remember the FFT, we sort of, ah, uh, wait. Good. So I practice this uh, at home first. Good. Now, often the way the FFT is done, I'm very proud of myself for being able to. Uh, I want to move this. I want to move it. Come on. Come on. No. I just want to move the circle. Oh well, imagine that this uh, circle is, uh, you know, you know, right around the center here. Maybe I can move it. Whatever. Ah, there we go. No. Okay. Imagine that this circle was the unit circle, right? And uh, and let's just go back to this thing. I won't bore you with this. And these are the real numbers, and these are the imaginary numbers. And um, here we have this uh, value omega that is here a root of unity. Uh, this one is of order eight. And if you look at all powers, all roots of unity of order eight, um, you know they lie here. Actually, maybe let's even, you know, let's uh, make it more interesting and uh, work with roots of unity of order 16. So we have 16 roots of unity of order 16, and they lie equally spaced around the um, complex unit circle, right? This is the uh, omega. So the way the FFT is taught usually is that what you go, what you do is, um, First of all, we're going to define this uh, set of points that we really want to evaluate or function at. And this is the set of points omega to the 0 up to, uh, in this case, omega to the 15. So, but in general, this would be omega to the n minus 1. So there are 16 of these points. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to take our polynomial A of x, which equals uh, summation, you know, i less than 16, um, a i x to the i. 
and we are going to compute uh, basically this function, you know, what is A at omega to the zero, what is A at omega to the one, all the way up to what is A at omega to the um, 15. This is the transformation that we're going to do. This is actually the inverse FFT, right? So we would like to do this uh, computation. Now, generally speaking, this would take uh, us uh, n squared. If we just uh, go one value by the other, right? We can take each one of these uh, elements and just uh, right plug it into the system. Um, you know, we compute some polynomial of degree 16, and there are 16 elements. It would take us 16 squared uh, time steps, whatever that comes out to be. I think it's 128, whatever, or 256, one of the two. 256. Uh, we could do that. That's the trivial way. But the FFT goes by a different way. It sort of says, um, well, here's the neat idea. And I'm repeating something that I'm guessing a lot of you have already uh, seen. So it says, let's for a second look at, uh, you know, what happens if you look at just the squares. So this is one square. This is the other square. Um, these are the squares. Uh, so there are actually eight of them, which is eight is half of 16. And there's this other group that is uh, omega squared, and it just has uh, uh, eight elements. So there's some, uh, I don't know, omega to the zero. There's some omega twiddle to the uh, seven. Good. Now, why is this useful? Let's go back to the other color. The reason this is useful is because we can write AX in the following way. We can say it is the um, even part plus X times the odd part. And then in order to solve the problem, we could, so we would like to evaluate uh, something on, uh, on, you know, on, on endpoints. So we want to evaluate something on 16 points, but we might as well evaluate a zero on, uh, on um, we can evaluate a zero on um, this uh, sort of yellow region, and we can evaluate a one on this yellow region. And the point is that um, because the squares only go over, um, you know, they only evaluate to a domain that is half the size of the original domain, the number of evaluation points that we have to solve for this subproblem is just uh, something of size eight. So there are only eight points that we need to care about, right? If we want to solve the problem of evaluating A of X on these 16 points, we can solve this problem on those 16 points, but there are actually only eight points that we care about because these sort of squares sort of they wrap around. And similarly here, we only have to solve a problem on eight other points, right? And once we have uh, these two tables of eight points and eight points, um, we can sort of combine them together in linear time and get our value. So it turns out that the time to compute the problem of size n turns out to be two times solving the problem of size n over two plus something that is linear in n. This is just repeating the you know asymptotic running time computation of the FFT. And this turns out to be and O of n log n, which is really great and really fast. So we went down from something that is n squared, we went down to something that is n log n, and that's really great. Okay. But we we wanted to get some, some mechanism for doing uh, you know proofs and arguing about and then basically you know some method for arguing that that uh, a table is a, that is evaluated over many points. Let me just go back to the problem we wanted to solve. So we have this problem here. We wanted to solve the following problem. We have uh, access, right? For the proof systems, we want something else. We have access to this table that is of size n, but we want to know that this is a polynomial of degree d. So that's what we want to solve. We want to know, so is this table a polynomial of degree D, where D, 
where d is much, much smaller, say uh, d equals, uh, you know, n over 4. This is the problem we want to solve, okay? Now, we want to solve it by asking a few queries. We don't want to read all of this table. In fact, we don't even want to read the d, d values of this table because in gener generally speaking, the number D in our case is going to be too large. It's the size of the computation. So we would like to get away by asking very, very few questions. And here's where the, where the FFT comes in handy. What I'm describing now is actually part of this um, Fry paper, um, the Fry paper, which is joint work with uh, uh, Ido Bentov, uh, Inon Horish, and uh, Michael Ryabtsev. Michael is also my co-founder and chief architect at Starkware. So we would like to know whether a certain table of size 16 is actually an evaluation of a polynomial of degree um, 4. And we don't want to make four queries. We want to make very few queries. So one idea is to sort of take the two subtables that are supposed to be polynomials of half the degree as this polynomial, and then somehow randomly add them up. And that's the main idea in this paper that's called Fry, and I want to explain where it comes from. And that's going to be the very last thing that uh, we're going to do in this talk. So let me explain what is the idea. So now I want to explain how some, some ideas from the world of FFT can help you uh, building uh, you know, proofs and or understanding whether a table describes a polynomial of low degree. So we have this, uh, oops. Wait, you know what, before I do that, let me go back and ask if there are questions here. Um, okay, I'll answer this question. Does every finite field have a representation as a sampling of the unit circle, or at least all the finite fields we're interested in? So the answer is no. In fact, um, no finite field looks exactly like the, um, the uh, you know, the unit circle, unix com complex circle. Um, but there are similarities. Uh, the similarities are that um, if you look at a multiplicative group of a subfield. So any finite field has uh, of size Q has a multiplicative subgroup that is of size exactly Q minus one. And it turns out that for any finite field, this multiplicative subgroup is actually, uh, it's a cyclic group and it is of size Q minus one. So for any finite field Q, its multiplicative subgroup is isomorphic to the group of roots of unity on the unit circle um, under multiplication. And uh, this, in fact, is one of the ways that you get sort of, uh, you know, the, the standard Fourier theory of, of characters. It sort of uses exactly this uh, isomorphism. And uh, one definition of what the Fourier transform is or the Fourier coefficients is representing things as transformations from the multiplicative group to uh, um, the unit circle um, on the field uh, over complex numbers. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's go back to this uh, very uh, last part. So, and this is the very last idea I want to share with you. So, so far we thought of this function as being, you know, a univariate function, right? This is a function. Basically, it goes from some uh, domain uh, S and it goes to the field F. So it's a univariate function. So now, you know, I'm just reading the last part in this uh, book by Sitchin uh, uh, Lu um, about the three, the three body problem. And there in the in the last part, he has this very nice, uh, I forgot if it's in the second or the last, he has this very nice uh, exploration of what happens when you live in three dimensions, but then you sort of enter 
uh, a universe that has four dimensions. So, you know, going one, adding another dimension makes things very interesting. And, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. So um, remember that we said that if we have a, a univariate polynomial, we can view it as, uh, you know, the even coefficients plus uh, x times the odd coefficients, right? A different way of saying the very same thing is to actually add a variable and say that this is equal, uh, you know, let's define a new variable. Uh, where y, so for y, uh, you know, y is supposed to equal x squared. So what we mean here is that if we uh, replace x squared by y, we get um, something that is a different representation of, uh, of, uh, of the same object, or a different, more formal mathematical way to say it is to say that a of x, this univariate polynomial, is actually equivalent to this bivariate polynomial, which is a0 of y plus x times a1 of y. Um, and this thing is modulo uh, this relation. So if you sort of associate y with x squared, you get this thing. So we, we seemingly have done nothing here. We just sort of wrote the same uh, equality as before, just using another variable. But this offers a very interesting sort of uh, you know, lifting to two dimensions because um, we could tell uh, the prover, you know, you claim to us that the function f of x is the evaluation of a univariate polynomial on a certain set of points. Well, an equivalent way to say this is that you are asserting that a certain bivariate polynomial, this bivariate polynomial, I mean, right, you are asserting that there is a univariate low degree polynomial that represents your function. It is equivalent to asserting that there is a bivariate polynomial that represents the same function over very specific points, over the points where y equals x squared. So I want to actually show you like a picture of what this might look like. So here we have, this is from the talk that we gave on Fry. What we're looking at here is the set of all points in two variables for which um, these are all points for which uh, y equals x squared. So 1 and minus 1. This is modulo 17. So this is uh, uh, all of this is done modulo 17. So 1 and minus 1 squared equal 1. Right, that's this thing. Um, turns out that right two and minus two, if you square them, it equals four. Uh, three and minus three, if you square them, it equals nine. Four and minus four, and then five, right? That's twenty-five. But twenty-five, uh, if you take remainder from seventeen, you get eight, and this is minus five, and this is uh, six and minus six and seven and minus seven. So. Now, what, what we're claiming is that, let's look back at what we're claiming. A prover came to us and said, sorry. Yeah. The prover made a claim to us. And that claim is that a certain function when evaluated at these weird points, at the points where y equals x squared, this bivariate function, it's a function, right, this, this function, uh, This thing. What?
Okay, so this function, you can think of it as some bivariate function in two variables. So this function is of degree actually um, 4 over 2 in the x variable. Sorry, in the y variable. And of degree 1 in x. Basically, being of degree 4, so if this is of degree 4, the degree of this is 4, is less than 4, then the degree of this is less than 2 in the y variable, and it's of degree less than 1 in x. So if we go to this picture here, if we go to this picture, we converted a claim about a univariate function that lives, uh, we sort of took a, about a univariate function that lives on a line and we sort of lifted it basically into some function that lives on a uh, plane. And the reason this is useful is because now in this plane, we can sort of do all kinds of weird things like ask for random linear combinations of, uh, of points here and basically get, um, like we could ask the prover, you know, please give us some commitment to um, a set of values um, basically that will be the bivariate polynomial um, restricted to um, x equals uh, 3, which means we are asking the prover to please give a value of the polynomial on all of these points. And these points or on this whole line. And, oops, these are now, um, we sort of took our problem that had 16 points and we convert, we can convert it in this way into a problem that has um, eight points. And these points are connected to the 16 original points in a very local way because from each two points that the prover gave us originally, we can deduce information about this random new point. So I want to sort of, uh, you know, conclude and sum up uh, these sort of musings on, on the connection between um, fast Fourier transforms and, uh, and, uh, and proof systems. The fast Fourier transform is this uh, mysterious and magical concept that uh, transforms information between different kinds of views. And it also is a very efficient algorithm that uses uh, a lot of structure and redundancy, uh, structure and symmetries of evaluation points to make the algorithm more efficient. Um, in the world of proof systems, we, if we could magically solve the problem of evaluating a polynomial at uh, points of our um, desire, and we could also ensure that a polynomial is low degree, we could solve our problem very efficiently. And it turns out that the um, fast Fourier transform, when viewed uh, or lifted above from a univariate setting to a bivariate setting, offers a very pleasant way to sort of uh, um, check that a polynomial, that a large table is indeed of small degree. And this is sort of uh, the way that these things are connected. Now, I want to pause here. I'm going to take questions in a minute. Um, I'm also going to, so we're, I'm going to ask here in Nepal whether for, you know, for, for a next talk, there are like two different things that, that we might uh, consider going into. One is arithmetization, which is why the hell would you want to use polynomials for anything related to proofs, 
right? How does redundancy play into succinctness and zero knowledge in the world of uh, proof systems? That's one thing that we could uh, discuss if anyone is interested. So we'll make a poll and you know, you could pick what you want. Another, uh, another kind of topic that we could sort of informally discuss is uh, let's call it story time. The history of uh, proof systems. There are all kinds of variants. You know, there, well, I mentioned PCP. There are interactive proofs. There are uh, um, uh, multi-prover interactive proofs. There are all kinds of versions and variants of proof systems that we can discuss. There's snarks and snarks and starks and uh, plonks and so on. And so we can look at uh, different uh, proof systems and sort of informally discuss them. Um, so we'll conduct a poll if you want to answer this thing. Um, and now I'll basically answer questions if there are. So let me go to the questions. If V has secret coefficients and evaluates that polynomial in the points A omega up to A omega for a commitment that the polynomial is not secret anymore, we can interpolate. So I guess this is a question um, about zero knowledge for first of all the one um the one who is supposed to have the secret coefficients is the prover here the verifier uh, doesn't know the, the secret coefficients those come from the prover right so the prover wants to hide information and prove some statement in zero knowledge um and uh yes you're right if the prover has these coefficients um and then evaluates them at a bunch of points then you can read um, D values, right? And from that, you can interpolate the original polynomial. So this seems to contradict zero knowledge, right? Um, but there is a trick around it. So there is a way for the prover to take uh, the secret coefficients, um, add a little bit of a few more coefficients. That's essentially the, uh, the trick. Um, and this is the same trick as in uh, Shamil's secret sharing. So the trick is that the prover has D secret coefficients, but the prover knows in advance that the number of queries is going to be small, let's say 10. So the prover is going to sample 10 more random coefficients and is going to encode a polynomial of degree uh, D plus uh, 9, not D minus 1, D, D plus 9. And it turns out that uh, with this, and assuming that the verifier only makes um, 10 queries, and none of these queries go into the domain where you originally uh, had the secret information, then basically this is an information theoretically, uh, what's known as a uh, perfect zero knowledge scheme, um, actually. Uh, meaning that you, from an information theoretic point of view, the verifier will learn nothing. Um, under this scheme. Um, are there any other questions? So there's a, there's a, there's a poll there. I see that so far we have, uh, you can go and click on the poll. And then meanwhile, while you're clicking on the poll, um, I'm gonna answer, I see there are more questions. This is also a very good time to mention at the very bottom, you might see this uh, this button that says the um, ZK Summit um, is going to be happening next week. So uh, um, I'm eagerly awaiting it. I'm going to be listening to uh, as many talks as I can. Um, if you're interested in ZK proofs, that's uh, you know the place that you want to attend uh, virtually. So let me now answer um, the other question. If, you use, if we use pry, fry to prove the degree of A of X is less than D, how many points of A of X does the prover have to evaluate and commit to? Suppose the execution domain is T and the evaluation domain is E. Okay, so if the execution domain is of size T, okay, then first of all, D is going to be pretty much T. Okay, that's number one. So D and T are the same. Now, the evaluation domain, uh, this, go, this goes back to a question that I was asked earlier, which is the relation, how much redundancy do you need? So the size of the evaluation domain is a, a, the rate, right? 
So if you go one eighth, it means that the size of the evaluation domain in your fry, the, the, the fry prover will commit to a domain that is of size eight times T. If you work with rate half, the prover will commit to a domain that is two times T. Now, how large or small do you want it to be? That's a parameter that will influence two things. Um, the larger the evaluation, for a fixed degree D, the larger you make the evaluation domain, so the harder the prover works because he's evaluating over more and more points, but uh, the better the soundness error that you get because the soundness error is dominated by the rate. And as you're in decreasing the rate, you're improving and reducing the um, soundness error. So this is a parameter that you get to play with. D has to be at least T, and then your evaluation domain has to be at least size T. In fact, it has to be something significantly larger than T, like at least two times T or a bit more than that. But then you get to pick it according to your rate, and there's this trade-off between proving running time and verifier uh, uh, soundness error and query complexity. Okay. So uh, let me just see. Uh, um, so I guess uh, let's look at the poll. At the poll. So I think yeah. Next time um, I'll do um, um, a discussion. Again, it will be informal. Uh, what we'll also do, um, I'll send um, in an email later on links to uh, you know more formal definitions, for instance, of fry, where, so this um, one slide that I took from, um, I don't know if you see it here, um, this was taken from a presentation on fry, and uh, the purpose of these talks is to sort of, you know, wave hands and informally um, discuss intuition. But uh, so that's why you have no definitions and no proofs and no uh, theorems. And I'll, I'll keep it this way in these informal talks. But I also want to then send links and information for those who want to actually uh, read more and understand the more formal um, connections and, and, you know, go over the proofs. So I will send a, a mail that will also have some information and links for reading more about the connection between um, Fast Fourier transforms and um, and uh, um, and Fry and proof systems. Okay, so uh, I see someone here is uh, asking to use uh, Zoom. Um, yeah, I think uh, Zoom is spyware, though. Uh, maybe I don't know. Um, I'm not sure that. Uh, yeah, well, well, we'll try once or twice more uh, with this thing. I think part of the problem may be more the um, sort of my inability to use the um, the graphic pad so well. So we'll see um, we'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, thanks very much to all of you for attending. Um, and you can you're welcome to send uh, feedback later. You know what you want. Um, you know, if this was too fast, too slow, too informal, too formal, because at least from my side, this is a very, uh, you know, I have no feedback. So feel free either using the chat or, um, you know, they'll just hang around a few more minutes in the chat room, even though we'll end this lecture. And if they have any feedback, please send it. This will greatly uh, help us uh, or help me uh, improve things for the next time. So thanks a lot. Check out the ZK Summit next week. Uh, thanks, you every, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, everyone. I'll just hang around just to make sure, you know, to see if there's, I wonder if I close this. Uh, uh, so I don't, I want to end the broadcast, but I'll hang around. And if, if you can't put any chat things, then just send me an email. Okay. Thanks. Bye.